very warm welcome. We're very happy, Davy and I, to be here in this land of poets and saints, and in our case, being disciples of a great master who was both a saint and a poet. Uh, he really, truly represents the Bengali spirit. So it's it's a wonderful joy for us to be back in his homeland. So the topic today, which we'll be addressing, how to find peace of mind in a turbulent world, will be based entirely on the teachings of this great saint, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, whom we call Guruji, so we'll refer to him in that way. Guruji explained to us that this world is made with the concept of duality, and it, it has to be this way. If there were only unity, then there would be no show. He said, for instance, if you're in a motion picture show, he would sometimes have his disciples go, and then he would tap them. This was often in the days where the movies were just in black and white, so it was easier to tell the concept. But then he would tap them on the shoulder and he would say, ignore the screen for a moment and look up at the beam of light coming down. The whole drama that you're watching is only a show of shade and dark, light and dark, uh, projected on the screen, projected in such a way that we see it as a drama with a beginning, a middle, and end, all the drama, the tensions, the character developments, everything that draws us in. When we're in a movie, he said, we become perfect yogis because we're completely concentrated and focused. For a little while in the movie, if it's a calm enough movie, we have achieved a little bit of peace of mind, but it doesn't last very long, of course. In fact, most movies are meant to help us avoid achieving peace of mind. They're, they're made in such a way to stir up the tensions uh, within us. And in that sense, they mimic the world of Maya, which is meant to stir up the tensions within us. And one could say, why in the world would God create a world of Maya with all this tension? And why doesn't he create something very beautiful and sattvic and uh, filled with peace so there's no turbulence? Well, we would get bored. We, are, we aren't ready for that. When we're ready for that, in fact, uh, that's the world that we'll inhabit. But Guruji explained that consciousness is like a wave it dips down in a trough, and that's we're unhappy. And then it rises up to a peak, and at the peak we're happy. And then that peak has to crash. So the the wave-like motion of this world of Maya is always going on. And so then it crashes down into a trough again, once in a while, the seas become calm. There's no storm and the waves are not whipped up. Guruji said during that time, we enjoy it for a little space, but then we become bored and we whip up the waves again. So it's our own nature that creates these waves. In fact, it's our nature, it's our own inner conflicts that are producing the turbulence that we see in the world today. In a very, very interesting article, Guruji, you know, he lived during the time of the First World War. And in fact, he left Calcutta um, at the time, of, at the end of the First World War. And then he came to America on the very first ship that sailed from India to America after the end of first of that great world conflict. But he said something very interesting. He said the war was terrible. It killed many millions of people. But he said following the war was a pandemic 
much like the pandemic that we've gone through just recently with COVID. This was called the Spanish flu. And the Spanish flu killed many, many more people than the war itself. So you could say that the disease was more costly to, to life, certainly, perhaps world peace also, than the war itself. But here's the very, very interesting thing that he explained. He said that it was the turbulence in the consciousness of people that had been stirred up during the World War, that there was so much anger and fear and negative emotions that those negative emotions transmitted through the ether brought the disease to the earth that didn't have to come but brought that disease to the earth because it was responding to the thoughts of mankind. And so we find in the world that we live in right now that there is a great deal of turbulence in the consciousness of people generally. You, you only need to look at a newspaper or look at the internet or television to see there's constant conflict. Everybody seems upset with everyone else. And that turbulence in the consciousness of mankind, that's what drew COVID to the, to the planet. The disease um, is, is there, but it doesn't affect us as much during times of relative peace. So Following the Second World War, we were in a long period of relative peace in the world. But now that peace has been lost and mankind generally seems to have entered <clears throat> a stage in which we're, we're wanting to be in conflict again. As long as we want to be in conflict, uh, obviously we're going to elect leaders that that. Uh, produce the conflict for us. We're going to elect politicians that want to sow fear and separation among us. And we're going to create problems in the world, not only of pandemic, but of disturbance in the weather. So all of the things that we're seeing in the world and thinking, oh, it's terrible that, that this is happening, they're really drawn by the consciousness of, of mankind. And one of the ways that we cannot find peace of mind, I'll start with the worst way to find peace of mind, the most impossible one, is waiting for the world to produce peace. Because if we want to wait, we'll wait the rest of our lives. We'll never see times uh, where there isn't conflict. So as in warfare, how does peace happen after warfare? Sometimes it happens by one side or the other achieving a complete victory, killing off all the enemy or finally killing their ability and will to fight, and then they withdraw, and then we have some period of peace. But when that happens, it sets in motion the seeds of future warfare. Only rarely do two sides that are in deep conflict decide that they can achieve peace by withdrawing or avoiding that conflict. And this is due in part, Guruji explained, to the very nature of our consciousness you know, we are not the ego. He defined the ego as the soul identified with the body and the personality. And as long as the soul is identified with the body and the personality, the very nature of that it has to be kept separate. And where there's separation, there's going to be conflict. Sometimes if the, that ego is strong, there will be a lot of turbulence. Yogananda explained that uh, one thinks that, uh, 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 again, referring to waves, that if we're thinking of a wave, that a big wave must be better 
than a little wave, right? Seems natural. But the big wave is the affirmation of the ego. And a little wave, the sea, is the sea of God, a sea of consciousness, in which resides in the depths the peace that we're seeking. But the, the, the great saints don't create big waves. They're, they're just a little bulge on the ocean. One time, Swami Kriyanandaji, who was our lifelong teacher, was listening to Master uh, giving discourses on, he was dictating some discourses, and Swami was just quiet and so much appreciating and feeling so much devotion for his guru. And then at the end, Yogananda finished his work and Swami Kriyananda came and Yogananda held out his hands to, I think, just to bless Swamiji and as if to help me rise from the chair here. And as Swamiji took his hands, Master looked deeply in his eyes and he said, just a bulge on the ocean, referring to himself, that the ocean of consciousness, he was only tiny, tiny bit separated from it. So the real attempt to find peace of mind has to begin with the calming down of the wave-like uh, pride of the ego in in being big, in being powerful, in being able to overcome other waves and everything that you see in the world of people with big egos. There's always going to be conflict with with ego because conflict comes from that ego. The very, the great, great scripture of India, the Mahabharata, and of course the part of the Mahabharata that is the Bhagavad Gita, is a description of that inner conflict that that mankind has, that God creates the creation, all of his own consciousness, so we are a part of that. The soul is a spark of God's consciousness, and the soul nature wants to come back. But as long as it's identified with the ego, then the ego wants to be separate because if it merges back, then it dissolves. So that inner conflict between the ego of separation, delusion and separation, and the soul nature of wanting to return to its unity in God, that is the essence of all conflict. And it's within all of creation. And that is what's portrayed in the great scripture, the Mahabharata. Yoganandaji, Guruji, explained uh, the depth of that spiritual analogy. And the Pandavas represent the soul nature. Specifically, they represent the chakras. And the Kuravas represent the the um, projection of ego into the world. And Duryodhana Yoganandaji explained was king material desire because the ego wants power. It wants material things. It wants possession. And the soul wants to leave all of that behind. And so the drama of life is that that goes on for a long, long time. Yogananda Ji said, as long as we have a desire, that desire must be fulfilled. Kriyananda, hearing this teaching, got a little concerned about this. And, and he thought, well, he can't mean every desire. So he asked Guruji, he said, you mean even if I have a desire for an ice cream cone, that has to be fulfilled? And Guruji said, oh, yes. All desires have to be fulfilled, but they can be also fulfilled on a higher plane. Ananda Moy Ma said something very beautiful. Someone asked her, isn't the desire for God just another desire? And she said, yes, it is another desire, but it is the only desire that ends all other desires. Because as long as we're in this world, there will be turbulence as long as there are desires. They will keep us 
caught and anchored. And so um, the desire for merging back into God is the only desire that will ultimately fulfill us and ultimately end the yearning, the hunger of the heart. But since we find ourselves in a body with an ego and in a world that's turbulent, yes, we have to try to work our way out of it completely, to, to dissolve the ego and get out of Maya, but that's a long, slow process. If every time we desire an ice cream cone, it creates, creates a, the attraction to have to fulfill that. So that long, slow process, while we find ourselves in this turbulent world in a practical sense, there are things that we can do to help achieve peace of mind even before we achieve the ultimate peace of mind that comes with dissolving the ego. And the first thing, when you think of two countries at war, peace is achieved when they withdraw from that conflict. And so the first thing that we should do is when there's a tendency for conflict, simply withdraw from it. We don't have to get involved in every little fight um, one time, Guruji, there was a man who was famous for um, kind of uh, insulting everybody and getting them mad. And he met with Guruji and he started saying, you're a fraud and you've done this and you've done that. And nobody believes in you. And Yoganandaji, now the typical ego, you know, especially for a world famous person as he was, would be to say, no, you're, you're wrong, I'm right, and, and you're crazy. Guruji did none of that. He said, you may be right. And the man was shocked, and he went on and denounced Yogananda for something else, and Yogananda, you may be right. And this Yogananda said, went on for an hour, and finally, at the end of it, the man slumped his shoulders and said, you're the only one who's ever defeated me. He said, everyone else, I've been able to get them riled up, but you're the only one who's ever defeated me. And then, because Yogananda simply refused to, to join in in the conflict, it's playing a game of tennis with no opponent is not very much fun. You hit the ball, it dribbles over to the other side, and pretty soon you give up that practice. So Yoganandaji gave us the example of simply not engaging in the conflict, even when it comes to us. But frankly, most of the things that disturb our mind is really none of our business. You know, there are things that we get so upset about, so disturbed about, that we're never going to have any real influence on it. I don't know if anyone is upset with a politician. Anyone here who has ever, ever had their mind disturbed by the action of a politician? What influence do you have? I mean, you can get all riled up and lose your peace of mind and finally three years in the future, maybe you vote against that politician and for another one who's not quite as bad as that one. In America, they have bumper stickers and often they're, they're a little bit humorous. And one of them said, if God wanted us to vote, he would give us politicians. Candidates, he would, he would give us candidates. So uh, the point here is that we, uh, we engage in conflict that basically we have very little power to do anything about. And so if we want peace of mind, simply disengage. It's really that simple. Now, partly... We get bored. Remember Yogananda's um, analogy of the wave? If, if we disengage and the sea becomes calm, 
we're going to start searching on the internet or the television station or something for something that'll rile us up a little bit and get that wave motion again. Gradually, Yogananda said, that takes on an anguishing sense of monotony to engage over and over and over again in likes and dislikes and um, upset and calmness. And after thousands of lives of this, we come into a life where we just, we don't want that anymore. In fact, there was an incident at Ananda Village in California, which is a village of people based on these high teachings. There's a family there who had a son at the time he was about six years old. And he was in our little market in the center of our community. And his mother was shopping and he was with her. And he said, Mommy, Mommy, can I have an ice cream cone? Can I have an ice cream cone? She said, no, we're just about to uh, go home and prepare dinner, and I don't want you to ruin your appetite. She said, please, please, can I have it? No, no, you can't. And then he kind of just got very quiet and said, Mommy, I don't want to be in this world anymore. And his mother got worried and said, oh, we can have an ice cream cone. We can. <laughs> but, but this was an advanced soul. That, that saw very quickly that desires, whether fulfilled or not fulfilled, don't end the desire to have desires. Only the desire for God ends that. So the first thing is to withdraw from the conflicts that, that don't concern you. And for those that actually do concern you, that are really yours, family conflicts or conflicts at work or something that's in your true immediate life, then do what Yogananda did. You may be right. How many arguments inside the home would be stopped by simply that attitude and that consciousness? So we don't have to engage and if we can calm our minds a little bit, that's the purpose of meditation, to calm our minds and to pull us back. You only need a little bit of detachment. You don't have to go into samadhi to realize that it's no fun having, being upset all the time. Just a little bit of detachment helps greatly. As Krishna said in the Bhagavad Gita, even a little practice of this sacred inner religion will free one from dire fears and colossal sufferings. And so even a little practice of meditation, a little practice of withdrawal of energy, will free one from, from the, those, the desire to enter into conflicts and bring about a great deal of peace of mind, which is what we're seeking. Another way of overcoming conflict is to have some, some, see, conflict and turbulence is a kind of a vibration, uh, restlessness on the surface of the water. Another way of overcoming the restless little wavelets on the surface of the water is to pour some oil on that. And quite quickly, the, the little wavelets cease. So we can pour onto the sense of conflict some higher kind of vibration. What do I mean? I mean the vibration of love or the vibration of kindness, of friendship. The vib- uh, so love or love in any of its many expressions we can pour on the vibration of wisdom, of joy, of uh, uh, any of the higher elements, the vibrations of God. And if we do that, even a little bit, conflict ends. There's a beautiful story that took place in World War I. During that time, there were trench warfares where the two opposing armies would be in trenches and they would only be a hundred or two hundred meters apart, 
and yet it was a total death zone to go into that. So for months at a time, they would be, the two sides would be fighting. But uh, this took place between the Germans and the English in a trench. And so one time they had been fighting for months at, the, at a time, and it came to be Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas. And the one side began singing beautiful Christmas carols, which are meant to bring the vibration of peace and goodwill and kindness. One side began to sing Christmas carols. The other side could hear that. And so they began to sing too. And because it wasn't competition of Christmas carols, they were both kind of coming back into their own higher nature. One man held up a white flag and and it was honored, and he came out into the middle of that no-man's zone. And soon, soldiers from both sides came out, and they began to exchange presents with each other. And one would pull out his a photo of his family and his, ch- his children at home. And even though they didn't speak each other's language, and the uh, hours before they had been trying to kill each other, During that time, where higher consciousness, the consciousness of love, overcame the vibration of conflict, during that time, everything became peaceful and they saw the humanity in each other. And then that time ended. They went back into their trenches and the officers ordered them to start fighting again uh, the next day or two. But the point here is that If we bring a higher vibration into the midst of conflict, then that higher vibration will calm the waters and will achieve peace of mind. So so in our daily life, if we reach out with kindness to other people, this very day we'll all go out leaving this auditorium we'll go out, we'll carry on our day, there will be several opportunities for you to do some little act of kindness. And it's good occasionally to do this to a stranger, for a stranger, I shouldn't say to, for a stranger. Do something. Swami Kriyananda would walk down the street One time we were with him, we were walking in a shopping area, and we saw this old lady who looked very careworn and uh, kind of her shoulders were slumped, and uh, you could tell that that she was uh, not having a happy period in her life, perhaps abandoned or, or lonely, you know, having lost her spouse. Don't know what the circumstances were, but you could see in her demeanor that she was she was unhappy. And Swami Kriyananda came up and said, oh, what a beautiful scarf that is that you're wearing. He just wanted to engage in so, And the woman's face began to brighten, and he said, oh, I love the colors of that. Do you often dress in bright colors? Like that, it's so beautiful. When you do that, you give pleasure to everyone who sees. And so he was just pouring kindness out. And and you could see second by second, the woman's posture became upright. Her face began, her eyes began to light up. There will be opportunities today for you to... Yogananda used, Aguji used a, a wonderful phrase... He said, shoot people with the buckshot of your smiles. So like a shotgun filled with the buckshot, but let that buckshot be kindness, be your smiles, and and just spread that out. So anything that we can do to put out the vibration that counters the, the conflicting. Remember the thoughts in the ether that Yogananda was talking about that, that brought about the, the um, 
uh, Spanish flu, the pandemic. Um, we can send thoughts in the ether of peace and harmony and kindness and love and joy. And if we do that, then, then we will begin to attract the etheric vibrations that will reduce the turbulence of this world. And then I would end by saying the, another thing that we can do is simply to serve others. When we think of ourselves, the, the seed source of all unhappiness is thinking of yourself, thinking of your needs, your desires, me. Swami has a humorous song that there's a chorus that goes, I, my, me, mine, I, my, me, mine. So that consciousness of I, my, me, mine, that always will produce unhappiness. When you forget about yourself in trying to help others, you will produce happiness in yourself and happiness in others. We were just talking with some of our uh, staff in our New Delhi ashram, and they said within... A, a day or two of the uh, closing down, the isolation, the shutdown due to COVID, they began calling people and serving people. They said, we never had any disturbance during the time of COVID. We were simply too busy helping other people. We never got upset about it. And so if we can forget ourselves by giving to, by serving other people, by thinking of their happiness. If we think of others' happiness and try to help them be happy, that flow of energy that uplifts them, Yogananda said, the channel is blessed by that which flows through us. So whatever difficulty you might be having, if you're lonely, then reach out in friendship to someone who's lonely. If you're feeling uh, pressure in any way, oppose that with the opposite positive vibration and give that to other people. And if you do that, you yourself will neutralize that negativity and poison within yourself, but you will also be a source of goodness and upliftment to the world. And the more that we can do that, we call us children of the light, those of us who want the light, the more we can do that, it starts a movement where others will do that same thing because through the law of magnetism, there's always action and reaction. Let our actions be positive, filled with kindness, filled with service, filled with peace of mind that comes from meditation. And if we become a light for the world, the world will begin to respond by becoming lighter. If we become a source of peace within ourselves, the world will respond by becoming less turbulent. So let's start with the only thing that we can really do that's effective, and that's work with our own consciousness. God bless. Good morning, friends. We want to thank you all for coming, and especially those who are here for the first time. We hope you find something that gives meaning and upliftment to your life. We also want to thank our wonderful team here in Calcutta for the amazing job they've done of organizing this event. And we are so touched by their dedication. And then there are a few people who have traveled some distance to get here this morning. A friend of ours I see from California, who uh, he didn't come for this event. He's visiting family in Calcutta, but it's a delight to see you all. So <clears throat> I will continue on the theme that Jyotish started, finding peace of mind in an unstable world. 
First of all, we need to understand that there is a choice before us. We live in a time of tremendous challenge, but also tremendous opportunity, opportunity for spiritual development and growth. Because it is not, I think we can all look back on episodes in our own life, it is not through the easy times when everything was going smoothly and happily and just as we expected. When you look back on those times, you think, I, I certainly have experienced it. Those weren't the times that challenged me, and they were not the times in which I grew. But when I look back at times of loss and confusion and uncertainty, I had to find within myself the strength and the clarity to continue. And so such are the times in which we live. We live in times filled with economic uncertainty, uncertainty about uh, global stability, uh, peace, warfare. We live in times of unsettled climate, all of these things. But we have a choice before us. And the cho- during such times dur- in which we live, and let's remember whether we're aware of it or not, our souls chose to incarnate in this time and in this place for a reason. And the reason the soul always chooses, the ego doesn't choose, but the soul chooses those that course of action that will lead it back to oneness with God. And we chose this time in which to live because the opportunities for spiritual growth are tremendous. Now, why is that? Be- because we, in order to maintain peace of mind, we have to discipline the mind. There are tremendous currents now of negative energy that are manifesting in all the ways we've been talking about. But we can discipline our mind. The theme, one of the themes that runs again and again through the Bhagavad Gita is, train your mind, O Arjuna. Do not be subject to all the fluctuations. The person who can train their mind and detach from the circumstances around them finds peace of mind. So we need every day, every day we have Dozens of choices before us. What someone says, as the man did to Yogananda, someone says something insulting. How are we going to respond to that? We, there's a great loss in our life on some level. How are we going to respond to that? We have a choice, and we can train our minds. I will not allow myself to be pulled into negativity. And uh, sometimes... There are, I'm sure we all have acquaintances that come up to us and all they do is complain or gossip and, oh, this is terrible and that's terrible. Well, you know, try to avoid such people if you can. They are not helping you in your development. They are only presenting an option of what you don't want to be. Try to discipline your mind to choose the positive Our lifelong teacher, Swami Kriyananda, who was a direct disciple of the great guru, our guru, Yoganandaji, we were trained by him, lived with him for almost 50 years. And in those 50 years, we saw so many challenges. We had a beautiful meditation temple at our retreat center, and Someone had left a candle burning at night. They were meditating. The cloth caught on fire. The temple burned to the ground. And Swami heard about it. And the next day, he was shopping in a local store. And he came in and he was singing. And the owner of the store said, your temple burned down and you are singing. She said, when my house burned down, I was depressed for six months. And Swamiji said, I lost the temple. I didn't lose my voice. I can still sing. 
And that was one little example of how to choose to react with calmness and positive energy no matter what happens. And that's one of so many stories that we can tell. Another time we were driving in a car with Swamiji. He was driving. We were going up into the mountains. And uh, he wanted to go skiing. As a younger man, he was an avid skier. And so we were driving along, but it started snowing and snowing. And the signs came up, pull over and put on the chains on the car. So Swami hit the brakes, but the car went into a complete tailspin. And it was spinning around the highway. Cars were coming in the other direction. It was snowing. And we crashed into a big bus that was parked along the side of the road. Luckily, no one was hurt, but the car was badly, it was total to be to put a fine point on it. And then Swami got out of the car and he looked up at the bus and he said, oh, this is going right to where we were going. Let's just take our baggage and get on the bus. So we called up the tow company. They towed the, towed the car away and we got on the bus and the other passengers on the bus were saying, oh, what a shame. Your vacation is ruined. And Swamiji said, I would feel just fine about this in a week. Why waste a week? And we went skiing and everyone had a lovely time. But the point is, why waste a moment in negativity? The cycles of pain and pleasure, joy and sorrow, gain and loss are constant if we live on that plane. But if we say, I, I discipline my mind not to react, and this is, then whatever happens, we walk through it untouched. One of the main things that in the wonderful book, Autobiography of a Yogi, that Yogananda gave us, uh, he talks about his guru, Sri Teshwar, and the discipline he received from him. But he said, I, we call our Guruji Master. Master said, you know, in India, we have the tradition not to cater to the body so much. Oh, I'm hot, I turn on the AC. Oh, I'm cold, I turn on the heater. He said, we're not like that so much in India. He said, we learn to accept and deal with whatever comes. And he said, when I came to Sri Teshwar's ashram, he tells a wonderful story <clears throat> it's, uh, in, in one of the chapters called How to Outwit a Mosquito. And he came to his guru's ashram in Sarampur nearby, where some of our friends have come from. And uh, it was, uh, Yoganandaji Master said, in his family home in Calcutta, when the mosquitoes in that season were very prolific, they would always draw the mosquito curtains around them. And so he's in Sri Teshwar's ashram, and Shri Teshwar doesn't use the mosquito netting. And Yogananda is bitten from head to toe with mosquitoes. And Shri Teshwar looks at him and he goes, poor boy, why don't you get a mosquito net? You can put it around your bed and get one for me too. Because if they, if they don't go to you, then they'll all come to me. So Master put the mosquito nets up. And it, it deterred the mosquitoes. But then one night, they, were, they slept in the same room. One night, Sri Teshwar didn't tell him to put up the mosquito net. And, they went, and he was waiting for his guru's instruction, didn't come. So they went to sleep, and Yogananda said he was going crazy with the drone of the bloodthirsty mosquitoes. And then he looked over, and Sri Teshwar was sleeping very quietly. And he, and he went over. There were no mosquitoes about him. But then he looked more closely. Sri Teshwar was in a deep state, a yogic state of samadhi. And at first he wasn't breathing. At first Master thought he had left the body. So he pinched his nose and tried to see what was going on. And then he heard Sri Teshwar start to chuckle. And he said, so, a budding experimentalist, my poor nose. You squeezed it so hard I can barely breathe now. But he said, don't you understand? You don't need the mosquito net. Rid yourself of mosquito consciousness. 
And that's why, and Yogananda understood, we don't have to respond outwardly if we change our inward consciousness and reality. He said from then on they never needed the mosquito nets because he understood that if he wasn't reacting to the mosquitoes, they wouldn't come. But maybe this seems like a dramatic step to take, but as I was saying, every day we are given the choice to react or not react. And one thing that I have learned, there's a long, long learning curve, but watch what you say. If someone says something to you that causes a reaction, if you react with your words, what happens? Back and forth, back and forth. But if you just remain quiet, then the, the energy dissipates. Also with your actions, it says in the Gita, never act in such a way that it will cause a reaction. And so if you're going to do something, you just, I try as much as I can to stop and pause and say, will this enmesh me more in karma or by acting in this way, or will it free me? And if I see it's just going to enmesh me more in karma, I think, no, I can let this go. So watch your reaction. If you want to find peace of mind, don't, as Jyotish said, don't expect the world to give it to you because it will not, ever. But you yourself can rise above the reactive process. And, and with learning to train and discipline the mind, it's something we never learn. We learned how to do technology and how to do sports and how to do art and so forth. But how few learn to discipline the mind. And only from that do we find true peace and happiness. Sri Yukteswar, once again, he was a jnana yogi. He was formidable. Uh, he, Yoganandaji said, if he had chosen, he could have been the most popular t uh, spiritual teacher throughout India, but he disciplined his disciples. And so few stayed with him because they wanted the ego bombs. But Sri Teshwar said, be like a lion of self-control. Don't let the, f the frogs of sense attraction kick you around. Wonderful, powerful, visual image. Lion of self-control. Don't let the little frogs of reaction kick you around. And so we have this choice. And the world in which we live today is its an ideal world for seeing the contrast. If I act this way, I only get more upset. If I control my behavior, if I discipline my mind, no matter what's going on, I find peace of mind. And I can walk through the world as a child. And all the more we can do that, the more the problems. It's like the waves part, and we can walk calmly and peacefully forward through our life. Now another point, we have the discipline and the training of the mind. But then there's also... What kind of energy are we putting out into the world? As Jatish was saying, if we are channels of peace, if we are channels of love, you're one of the great leaders of humanity, Mahatma Gandhi, said, we must become the change we want to see in the world. If we want peace, we can't wait for peace to come to us. We have to act with peace. We have to act with kindness. So the first point, training the mind, we're kind of, uh, it's more of how do we respond? The second point of acting in positive ways, that's what are we initiating? What kind of energy are we putting out? And again, this is a choice. Always, always to move forward and to uh, just say, no matter how people treat me, I can act with love and kindness. There was a beautiful story we read about uh, a Tibetan Buddhist monk, a lama, who when, and I'm not emphasizing politics or nation, national activities, but we all know there was a history when 
the Chinese invaded Tibet and many of the spiritual leaders were imprisoned and the Dalai Lama had to flee. Uh, and this one high lama was imprisoned and for a number of years and was tortured and beaten and so forth. And finally there was so much public outcry that he was released and he came and was talking with the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama said, oh, that must have been very dangerous for you. And it's such a difficult situation. And this humble monk, Lama, said, oh, yes, sir, it was very dangerous. And the Dalai Lama said, you mean they were about to kill you or torture you? He said, oh, no, it was dangerous because I almost lost my compassion for the man who was torturing me almost lost my compassion. That was the danger. And so if we, in that circumstance, dramatic, he was able to respond with compassion. And you know, I don't know even the name of that Lama, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but think about his soul's journey by going through that experience and coming out with love and compassion, his soul is forever elevated. Those are things, gifts that are now permanently his own. And so it is with us. If we can overcome the tendency to react, even if someone is wrong, we don't need to judge them. We can still shine the light of compassion and forgiveness on them. We're very delighted to be in Calcutta at this time, right before Durga Puja. And our lovely friends in Calcutta gave us the beautiful Durga Murti, which we will treasure. But, you know, it's not enough just to have an image of Durga and approach it with reverence and dissolve it in the river, or whatever form it takes, we need to understand the deeper aspect of this great consciousness behind Hinduism and the gods and goddesses. What does Durga represent? What qualities does she represent? It's not enough to see her at a distance or some goddess that we propitiate for her favors. We have to understand she represents our own highest nature. And each of the deities of India represent a part of ourselves that we can bring to the forefront. So Durga, what does she represent? Strength and courage against all obstacles. She represents power and strength and wisdom. And as Divine Mother, she represents kindness and love and forgiveness. These are all aspects of ourselves. And in this time of Durga Puja, let's remember that. She's not far away from us. Only she's far away if we hold her at a distance. But if we say, I am one with you, your nature is my own highest nature, then we truly, truly perform Durga Puja. And so it's a good opportunity to do this now. And finally, I will conclude with this thought. We've been talking about how to find calmness in a turbulent world, in an unstable world. But remember, friends, that's just the first step. There is calmness is our own true nature. And the more we live it, the more we live the qualities of Madurga, the more we express strength and courage and compassion and wisdom, the more that calmness and the, those qualities begin to expand within our own consciousness. Because the true nature of humanity is peace and calmness. And whatever the world throws at us, if we can stand, Master said, the yogi should stand unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. And it seems like that now sometimes, breaking worlds. But if we can stand unshaken, 
then we remember who and what we really are, that our consciousness is calmness. And the more our consciousness is filled with calmness, not in reaction to the world around us, but just awakening who and what we really are, the more we can do that, the more our consciousness moves towards the changeless infinite state, which is an aspect of the divine. And so finding peace is just the beginning. The end of the journey is to merge with the infinite changelessness, which is our own destiny, which is the goal we are all seeking on some level. And these, the times in which we live, can be a tremendous gift to move towards that changeless, infinite consciousness that is the only source of true happiness and true peace of mind. God bless you.